Hello and welcome back. This week we're going to make some changes and we'll be back to first aid next week, don't worry. But this week is going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about the most complex, adaptable, fascinating machine ever conceived of and some of the tools to help when it's not working properly. I'm not talking about the beautiful 2019 R1250 GS Adventure with the progressive cams, all the rest of its beauty. Nor am I talking about my Adventure Designs fantastic tool roll. I'm talking about the human brain, the most incredible adaptive machine ever conceived of. Obviously these tools can't be purchased on Revzilla or Tourtech. Your baggage for this stuff doesn't come from Moscow Moto or Wolfman. This is baggage that we bring with us from past trauma. This presentation really boils down to my opinion, but I have worked in the mental health field. Uh, I've taught psych classes in nursing. I have a great deal of personal experience with trauma and psychiatric medications and addiction and so on. I'm not going to get into the gory details of that, but I have some level of personal and professional experience on these topics. If you require assistance, don't hesitate to seek out professional help. When I worked in hospice, people would often ask me, when do we need hospice? And I say, if you're asking the question, you need it. Same thing with mental health issues. If you're considering whether you need help or not, you likely need some help. So with that, let's get underway. The roadmap for today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about my experience. We're gonna talk about ACEs, might not be what you think. We're gonna talk about self-medicating, that might be exactly what you think. We're gonna talk about anatomy and physiology, one of my favorite things in the world. We're gonna discuss a little bit about neurotransmitters and neurons, and we're gonna dig deep into stigma and grace and love, finally. So my own personal and professional journey, this again, we're not gonna get into the gory details. This is just a, a quick snippet. Professionally, I started out on a uh, medical surgical floor in a hospital in Northern Colorado. It was an amazing experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Uh, great people, great facility. Can't say enough good about it. And that's where I really learned physical aspect of disease, surgery and, and cancer and diabetes and so on and so forth. It was, it was one of the best learning environments a nurse could hope for. And as I went, I discovered more and more that there was a, a link to emotional trauma and physical disease. And that was very interesting to me. And I uh, was a psychiatric nurse for a while, like I said, and a lot of the disease of the body have roots in trauma and mental health. So the ACEs study. If you don't know about this, I would strongly encourage you to Google it. It's a fascinating subject. I can't remember the year, but, but there was a study done because so many people that were receiving surgery to combat obesity, like gastric bypass and things like that, is very effect effective at weight loss. But uh, many of the people that had the surgery were gaining weight back at a rate that the, that the researchers didn't think were, was possible. And so they dug into it to figure out what was going on with this unbelievable weight gain, unprecedented speed. And from that study was born the uh, ACEs. And there's 10 questions on these ACEs that are predictors of physical health and future disease. And people's minds were blown. These were, a lot of the participants in the study were middle class, um, young to middle aged people, it seemingly having a good life and not uh, living a life of trauma. But what they discovered was that the traumas of their past um, affected their, their health. It wasn't just obesity. There were multiple disease processes, diabetes, uh, cancer, um, et cetera, et cetera, that were influenced by past trauma in the ACEs study. Uh, Oprah Winfrey did a show about this years ago. They touched on the resiliency aspect of this, which is the how you combat trauma that you suffer. If you have, uh, if you're able to develop resiliency, you can bypass a lot of the negative effects of trauma, uh, which is great news. 
So from that, you know, we learn that they have this, this physical impact on our bodies from the trauma, but there's also changes in the brain. The brain actually physically changes in the, when it's steeped in this trauma. You don't process information the same way. You have uh, uh, decreased coping ability, or at least altered coping ability, on and on, many, many things. So there's a whole gamut of information that we're not gonna get into detail. If that's something that you find interesting and want me to talk more about, uh, leave something in the comments. And if, if there's some response to that, I'll make a video about um, ACEs and trauma. So self-medicating. So it talked about how many people have this, this trauma and this, this response um, and they may dissociate and check out and they're not in the present moment. They're physically there, but um, emotionally and intellectually, they are not present. And, and so in order to deal with that, they may choose substances that improve their attention and focus like methamphetamine. And some people choose food as a, a method to cope with their stress. Frequently, the substance a person chooses has the opposite effect of their trauma state. So if someone has a PTSD type of response where they have a heightened awareness and they're back into the uh, trauma, like physically reliving it, then they may choose a substance that blunts that, uh, a depressant like alcohol or marijuana or any number of other depressants. And we're going to talk about this more in the future, but in my experience, addiction is never, ever a weakness of character. 99 times out of 100, there is a traumatic event that precipitates their, their need for a substance. Traumatic event has created a, a structural change in the brain and a chemical change in the brain that predisposes somebody to addictive behaviors and addictive coping. Okay, so I wanna talk about anatomy and physiology. This is a picture of, an, of a neuron. Part with the purple oval in there is the cell body. And then the long arm that comes out of the side of it is called an axon. There, there won't be a test on this, don't worry. But the anatomy it really becomes important when we get to the uh, synaptic cleft. So the synaptic cleft is where all of the messaging takes place. So the, the cell body is up ahead uh, above this. And then this is the presynaptic cell, the end of the axon. And these circles represent uh, little capsules of a neurotransmitter. The little green spots are the neurotransmitters. And then when this cell is stimulated, those neurotransmitters come down to the uh, presynaptic cell and are released into the synaptic cleft, some kind of aqueous environment where uh, there's a, a space between two cells and the neurotransmitters are the little green things again, and they come and they activate these receptors. And when the receptor is activated, a message is sent down to the next cell. Different neurotransmitters activate the cell in a different way. We're gonna get more into this, don't worry. This is just trying to get you familiar with what's happening. The neurotransmitter comes down the axon, jumps across the presynaptic or the synaptic cleft, activates the receptors in red, and then sends a message down to the next cell. Okay, so there's dozens of different neurotransmitters. I'm only going to talk about a few of them and not in great detail. Again, if there's something here that you want to know more about, please leave a comment in the comment section below and I'd be happy to dig further into this stuff. I find it fascinating, and to me it's helpful when I'm talking about mental illness and addiction and things like that. We're talking about norepinephrine, same to adrenaline, um, and pretty much everybody's familiar with adrenaline, it makes you heightened, okay? In the brain, it does the same thing. It, uh, it heightens your awareness. If you have low norepinephrine, you can be depressed. If you have high norepinephrine, you can be manic. Uh, dopamine, it generally known as the feel-good neurotransmitter. Dopamine is also very linked to memory, but also has a strong emotional component to it and is really important in behaviors surrounding addiction. Generally speaking, when you experience a positive sensation, uh, dopamine is released into uh, the reward center of the brain. There are certain behaviors that 
may trigger more dopamine release in some people than others. Somebody who has an addiction to gambling, say, they might have a stronger dopamine release of gambling or when they're about to gamble or when they're planning to gamble or when they see a casino, they get that dopamine release. Whereas it doesn't really affect me that way. I don't have a gambling addiction. So I don't get that same dopamine release that they do. Um, but that is not uh, uncommon for somebody who has whatever addiction it might be. Um, food, sex, pot, uh, alcohol. If somebody who is addicted to alcohol may have the same dopamine release when they see a bar or a liquor store. And then it's dopamine is fascinating because it also works backwards. It helps you remember. It solidifies those pathways that got you to that place in the first place. So if you're a hunter gatherer and you're walking along and you find a, a spring, I need to remember where that spring is so that when I'm thirsty later, I can come back here and get some good drinking water. So dopamine is at work remembering or solidifying those pathways that got you to that spring in the first place. And creating art releases dopamine, riding motorcycles releases dopamine, uh, all those kinds of things. It's not all bad. We're going to talk more about what makes something addictive or pathologic um, here in just a minute. But just know that dopamine is really centered around pleasure and uh, reward. Serotonin, uh, a lot of antidepressants work on serotonin. It heavily involved in uh, mood and libido. Serotonin plays a role in sleep and arousal. And it's when you have low serotonin, you're more depressed. When you have higher serotonin, you're more aroused, more awake. So in the last one I want to talk about is uh, GABA. GABA acts at the, the postsynaptic part of that cleft, at the, the bottom part of it. So it helps to inhibit signals coming through and those electrical pulses. Too much GABA can make you like blunted, have a blunted response. Drugs that stimulate GABA or that work on GABA, we give for people who are having uh, significant anxiety or seizure, um, where the brain is hyperactive we can stimulate GABA to calm that activity down. And if it's get too much of it, then we stop breathing. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about pathology here um, and the effects of disease. And then this is where uh, mental health can interfere with your day-to-day -day life. Just for argument's sake, let's pretend that there's a balance in brain chemistry, okay? And 10 is out of balance and zero is out of balance, but five is fairly balanced. Okay, everybody has some variance in this. Everybody is like super happy, excited, or, or very sad and depressed. Okay, everybody has that variance. But we all kind of stay in the middle for the most part. Some people who are uh, bipolar, they have these mad swings where they go way into the 2-1 region, right? Um, and then they can if they have an extreme manic phase, it can come way up into the 10 region and, and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on max out credit cards and buy things that they would have no uh, use for and think that they're royalty and have all of these really destructive behaviors um, that appear outwardly as behaviors, right? Um, and then uh, go into these deep, dark depressions where they sleep for days and don't eat and are profoundly ill. When does your variance or my variance become pathologic or a disease? Behaviors on both sides of the spectrum are not conducive to a fulfilling life where one feels connected to society. And then this is where it becomes pathologic. Everyone sleeps. I hope everyone sleeps. But when you sleep for days at a time, you're losing connection with society and those relationships with the, the people that care about you. And then it starts to become pathologic when you can't hold down a job, when you um, are unhappy with yourself. That's when we start seeing a disease process. So in addiction, when does drinking become an addiction or pathologic. I knew a guy many, many years ago who had five DUIs and his fifth DUI landed him in prison. That was pathologic alcoholism. There was no consequence that would have prevented him from drinking. 
An addiction is a compulsive behavior that persists despite the consequences. Nothing would have prevented this guy from drinking. No level of consequence. His brain had changed to the point where he could not live without alcohol. Alcohol overrode everything, consequences, food, water, shelter, all came second to alcohol. Incidentally, alcohol is one of the few substances that if you stop abruptly, if you are a heavy drinker and you stop abruptly, you can die from it. So alcohol is blunting the transmissions in the brain as a depressant, okay? It's depressing those transmissions and your brain is always trying to be in the middle, right? So when you pour a bunch of alcohol in it, it actually adapts. So as you move down here, the brain is adapting and it's coming uh, back to the middle, okay? So if you stop this uh, that alcohol consumption abruptly and you stop that depressant abruptly, your brain can't catch up that quickly. So it shoots way off onto the high side and you get things like seizure where you have all of this activity in the brain, okay? And so that's why you can die from from abruptly stopping alcohol. You need to do that in a hospital where they can give you uh, things that stimulate GABA and uh, uh, decrease that activity so you don't have a seizure and die. I've seen many, many people suffer from these late effects of alcoholism and they are profoundly ill, profoundly ill in their entire body. This is what it's about, okay? It's about neural transmission. And I wanna talk about tolerance because it has, it's important not only in addiction, but in mental illness as well. And when I say mental illness, I suffer from mental illness to some degree. I think the majority of people suffer from some degree of mental illness. So again, this we see a picture of the uh, neurotransmitter going across the synaptic cleft. Let me get the whiteboard out here. And let's my favorite example of, of tolerance is nicotine. Let me talk about nicotine. We have receptors that will accept nicotine obviously okay we if someone who smokes i used to smoke it triggers uh, those receptors in the brain and we get a sensation the first time we smoke we get uh, lightheaded and get a buzz and we may get nauseous and so on and so forth um, but we have a response in the brain okay and it lights up a bunch of these receptors it's a, it's a significant response but nicotine goes away fairly quickly. I forget how long it lasts in the brain, but it's pretty short-lived. That's all well and good for the first time we smoke. But as we continue to smoke, we can actually decrease the number of receptors. Okay, let's just pretend that these are nicotinic receptors and they're, they're triggered by nicotine. But if we smoke for years, these receptors start to diminish. Okay, and we have less and less effect. When we have less and less effect of our substance, of our coping substance, what do we do? We take more of it. And it takes more to fill the receptors we have. The, the, this uh, has this effect, they pop off a little bit. And um, so it has this blunted effect. We've lost some receptors over time because there's so much nicotine in here. We lose more receptors because the system just can't handle it. Um, and we have less effect, okay? This is the effect going down being diminished because there are fewer receptors. And so we have to keep nicotine on these two receptors more and more frequently to get the same effect. When we start out smoking, we might start, we might smoke one or two cigarettes a day. Then uh, it isn't too long before we're smoking a pack a day. And then if we persist and we have uh, stressors in our lives or whatever, we might be up to two packs a day. Just to keep these two receptors going and keep those full as much as we possibly can, we have to smoke pretty much constantly to maintain the, the response downstream from the receptor. This is the tolerance. It takes more nicotine more frequently to have a similar effect. And the, if, when I say similar, I actually mean blunted because we, don't, we no longer are getting that buzz in our head. We're getting uh, normal. We go back to the spectrum Here's our first cigarette, we get all buzzed and wow, that was really something. And then, you know, months later, we have a cigarette and we're right here. We might have a slight uh, physiological change, okay, but nothing like that first cigarette. And then over the years, that gets way down here. So 
without a cigarette, we actually feel terrible, okay? And the cigarette brings us back to the middle. We need the cigarette at this point to feel normal. It's like somebody who has significant struggle with alcoholism, the, the alcohol helps them feel normal. They feel terrible without it. Is that you get to a point where you feel terrible without it and normal with it, okay? The, the balance is with the drug because the brain has changed. The structure and the receptors have changed so much that now you feel normal with it. And without it, you feel terrible, okay? And that's why it becomes more important than shelter, food, water, family connections, everything else. You feel so bad, you're so far down this side that you're willing to do anything for it. And beyond the addiction, trauma works that way too. People who struggle with depression, like I do, I have a propensity for depression. When I'm stressed, I fall into depression, okay? And I, I self-loathe and I do all of these things that are self-destructive, just like an addiction is. So the brain structures and mental health, we talked about how we lose receptors, uh, we need uh, more and more of something. Same thing in uh, uh, depression or anxiety. I may have more receptors in my brain that, that give me the propensity for depression, where somebody who has uh, a propensity for a hyper-aroused brain might suffer from anxiety. And these receptors are gonna get really important here in just one second when we talk about like antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. Bring back my synaptic cleft here. So I might have fewer receptors serotonin. Let's pretend the green neurotransmitter is serotonin now. So if I take a medication, an antidepressant, that works on serotonin, it allows for more serotonin in this area. Okay, so the green serotonin comes in here, it activates the receptor. I don't have very many serotonin receptors. So the serotonin comes on here, sends the message, and then it pops off, okay? It only stays on for a little bit. Well, if I have few receptors or I'm not making a lot of serotonin, then there's nothing to trigger it. But if I take a, uh, well, and, and when this pops off, it actually goes back and gets recycled, okay? Um, if I take a medication called an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it keeps this serotonin in this area more often. This is the synaptic cleft, okay? So instead of getting sucked back up in here and being made into serotonin again, it keeps it in here. So it pops off for a little bit, and then the next one comes in and fills the space, right? Um, but if we keep it in here, it can fill the space more and more frequently. It keeps going back in there, keeps going back in there, keeps sending the signals down, and um, that helps combat my depression. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they focus on serotonin. So that's why the synaptic cleft is so important and the structure of the neuron is so important. So when things come down uh, into that synaptic cleft, they're working to keep them there and have uh, more response on those receptors. Um, I used to work with a guy who he made snow for ski resorts and he called snow frozen Prozac. I think most of us could say that this is mechanical Prozac, okay? This uh, increases our adrenaline, this increases our serotonin, we're happier, we're focused, we feel better. Um, we have a physiological and neurological response to this machine. Whereas some people, it's, it's skiing, boating, what, name your thing. But when these things don't have that same response, now we're starting to get into the pathological side of it and uh, we may benefit from a medication. Stigma. This is the big thing. This is my meat and potatoes right here. I despise stigma regarding mental health disorders. This clip, uh, there's a whole series of these. If you Google, if physical disease were treated like mental illness, you'll see several of these, several of these graphics, but these are a couple that I think really drive home the point. The first one says, I get that you have food poisoning and all, but you have to at least make an effort. Somebody who is struggling from alcoholism, depression, anxiety, uh, any number of schizophrenia, any number of things, they have physical changes in their brain. Their brain is different than somebody else's. 
It would be just like if they had food poisoning. That is something happening to you physically. And to say, have you tried, you know, making an effort? Have you tried to not be schizophrenic? Have you tried not being depressed? Of course, everyone who is depressed or anxious has tried to not be. They don't want to be. We don't sign up for depression. Woo! No, it, we have changes in our structure of our brain and in the chemical balances that make us depressed. So it's no different than food poisoning. This, the next one, I love this. So the guy obviously has an arterial bleed. It's spurting out. We're going to talk about arterial bleeds in another episode, a few, few weeks. If you just change your frame of mind, then you'll feel better. The guy's missing a hand. The arteries are spewing blood out, right? And she says, change your frame of mind. Um, uh, be happy. Uh, just get your shit together. It, it, it's not how it works, obviously. The, there's either fewer receptors or, or you, uh, the trauma um, that you suffered at some point in your life overrides all else. There's nothing that you can do to just stop it. It takes pretty significant intervention, um, whether that's medications or therapy or any number of interventions. 12 steps work great for some people. Medications work great for some people. The multiple modalities that help people with mental illness. Unfortunate thing is that I look okay so that if I had a cast on my leg or something, people would say, oh my gosh, you're hurt. Um, what happened? You know, anybody who's had a cast, you hear that. What happened? A trillion times. No one asks about your mental illness. No one says, how's that depression going for you? Are you doing better? Is there something I can do to help you? Whatever, whatever. No, we say, you know, just be happy. I don't like that. Um, change for me so I feel better. I frequently, I've worked with clients, family, friends, a lot of people around mental illness. And I frequently tell them the cast story when they ask about medications. And especially when I've worked with youth. Because of stigma and this idea that you're just supposed to be tough and do it yourself, many people are resistant to therapy and to medications and other interventions. So I ask them, I say, if you broke your arm, what would you do? And they're like, well, I would go to the doctor or go to the emergency department. Okay, and what would you do there? Well, I uh, would get a cast. Yeah, yeah. If you had this x-ray and you broke your uh, radius and ulna to that degree, you would be in significant pain. Nothing would fix that. Nothing would make that those bones grow together properly and the pain diminish and have improved function of your hand until you had an x-ray to see what was wrong. Uh, and you had the, you probably had to have surgery on it to uh, screw those bones back together and then a cast around it to keep it in place until it healed. There's a whole process to this bone healing so that they net properly and you they're strong and you have uh, function in the part of the limb below the fracture it, and it's not mysterious. It's, it's a very formulated recovery. And you walk out with your cast and people want to sign it. And they're like, oh, tell me the story. And you're like, oh, I went over the handlebars. And I reached out and, and I, I heard it snap. And it, oh, like I could see the, the deformity of the bones. And it was like so painful. And tell these gory stories. And people are like, yeah, that's awesome. Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But you get some level of support. It's rare that you get that for depression, anxiety, uh, alcoholism, unless you're in a 12-step program or with a therapist who's offering you that, that feedback and the diagnosis and treatment and therapy and all the things that we do for a broken arm, we can apply to mental illness. You would get a cast. You wouldn't just say, I can, I can power through this, I'm gonna be better you would end up with worse injury. And that's what a lot of people suffer through. I've been through all of this.
mental health problems, addiction, continued recovery. I've been there. I am there. A lot of us are. Most of us, I think, are. This whole idea of being a tough guy and getting over it is a lot of the problem. That's where a lot of the problem comes from. Is this idea that we need to be tough and we need to get our stuff together and pull ourselves up. This is real. This is a real disease. It's no different than a broken arm. None. No difference. I have experienced the love and grace of Jesus. And that turns some people way off. Some people just have checked out right now. I get that too. I've been there too. I can't live without him. He gives me grace every single day. And I have to do the other things. In the Old Testament, it, our pastor was telling us the other day that it mentions that there are medicines for to heal the sick. We have prayer too, but we also have medicines. We have antidepressants. We have anti-anxiety medications. We have therapy. We have each other. You're not weak. You're not a bad person. This whole idea of the lone wolf is destructive. We're all in this together. If you need help, Google Crisis Line. There's somebody there that will help you. They will help you. You will get help. You're totally worth it. And I don't know you, but I love you. Next week, we start a new series, and uh, it's going to be more about the first aid. Again, if you find this kind of thing helpful, I can talk a lot about addiction, medications, mental health disorders. We can really drill down deep into those topics. God bless you. Little test run right here. Little test run for sound and for lighting, position. Gotta turn that heater off.